the break is finished, so we need to continue with this uh, agenda of this Parallelware uh, Tools Workshop. So before the break, we, it was a really great session. We had uh, so many questions and interactions from you that I really <coughs> hope that we keep on having this great learning atmosphere. And essentially what we introduced, as you, if you remember, the very basic concept, the minimum concept that we need to understand what we are doing when we go to the GPU. <coughs> and we uh, saw the key differences between the CPU and the GPU. And we also saw examples of how the OpenACC and OpenMP code looks like for multi-threaded CPU and for GPU. And we, used the, the, we did this without really introducing the formally the, the semantics of the pragmas and the clauses. We somehow learned and got used to the syntax through the examples that we showed in the demonstration of the, of the tool using this Pi calculation example. So I'm very happy because we also covered many, many of the features that we have available in, in the tool. And we also discussed many interaction issues that might appear with the file system, with other tools, with workflows. So it was really, really a great, uh, great session. So now, <coughs> We are going to jump into the more uh, new key concepts or distinguishing part of this uh, training that is learning the, um, the families of parallel patterns that we are consider considering right now. Learning <coughs> what different parallelization strategies sorry, we have for each of these patterns. And these parallelization strategies, where can they be applied? to CPUs, GPUs, multi-threading, offloading, tasking, OpenMP, OpenACC. Imagine we have many, many combinations that we can create many different parallel versions, implementations of the same simple code, okay? So let's go into lecture three parallel patterns and uh, know the details about all of this key part of the, of the trading. So first I would like to begin with thinking about what OpenMP and OpenACC really do for us. These are uh, text extracted from the specification of OpenACC. And I really like to highlight this part. More or less everything is a consequence of, of this. Programmers need to be very careful that the program uses appropriate synchronization. What this means is that in practice, OpenMP, OpenACC don't guarantee that the code is correct. It is us as programmers that have to guarantee that the pragmas and clauses that we add to the code will behave correctly in parallel. OpenMP and OpenACC provide a great support from the compiler that makes all the hard stuff of generating the calls to the multi-threading library of the operating system. That's the hard part of the work that the compiler is doing, automating that part. But we are still responsible for selecting and writing the appropriate pragmas, the appropriate clauses, and the appropriate options for the clauses. If we make a mistake in one of them, the program may be incorrect. And if the program is incorrect, don't blame on the compiler, don't blame on the standard, don't blame on the machine. It's that we wrote incorrect code, okay? So OpenMP and OpenACC make programmers responsible for making good use of the pragmas and the, and the directives. So we need to learn best practices of how to use the pragmas and the clauses. We have reference guide, quick start guides, great tutorials that explain in a lot of detail the semantics of each pragma, each clause, each option, and what are the variants between C, C++, and Fortran, and different compilers. But what is really missing in another, another training is how do we relate, how do we combine all of these bricks in the best way for our code? We can combine them in many different ways. Which is the best way and why? This is what the patterns we provide us, the knowledge to know how, how to decide, we guide us in the decision of what pragmas and clauses should we use and how we should combine them for our specific code, okay? So the patterns, the decomposition of the application in patterns will help to make good use of OpenMP and OpenACC. We'll speed up the parallelization process. This is important because if we don't invest time in understanding this, the other approach is try and error. I write parallel for build, run, runs correctly. I think I'm, it's, my code is correct. But maybe it's correct for that run. Maybe another run provides incorrect results. 
or maybe I change my input data, a different problem, and my program that was correct for a given data set now behaves incorrectly. And again, it's my responsibility to do so, to do it correctly. So it can speed up the decision process because we invest a lot of time trying to debug and trying to find the bugs and fix them in correctly written parallel code. The question is, can we avoid making the most common mistakes when we first add pragmas and clauses and avoid these common mistakes and save that time in development and use that time for other purposes? Can we do that? The patterns will help you in that. And also, the patterns are based on best practices for parallel programming. The parallelization strategy that we are supporting right now, that we will see in this slide deck, are based on the analysis of, for instance, the Coral benchmarks. We have analyzed all the parallel implementations of the Coral benchmarks. We have published a scientific paper that can be downloaded from supercomputing two years ago, where we analyzed all of the implementations and we came up with the conclusion that with collaborators from Julich and Orris National Lab, that the three impl implementations that we are supporting right now are the most widely used implementations of the patterns that we are supporting. Can you implement it in a different ways? Yes, you can. But we try to imitate and promote best practice of what the expert developers have done when they develop the coral benchmarks and try to have that knowledge and incorporate it in a tool so that you can learn from that and apply it to your codes. Okay? So, Based on that, it is likely that if you choose the right implementation if you, for the given pattern, then you will get a good performance. I'm not saying peak performance, because peak performance is always very hard. But good performance, you can get it, and we will show it today. Okay? <clears throat> so, we said this morning that we know that real codes are large and complex. So we need to approach real codes from a different perspective. Let's use components for that. And I talk in terms of components. So we start from the serial code. And the serial code, we need to analyze it in terms of components. By components, I mean different types of components. One type of component are scientific components. We try to avoid always to reinvent the wheel. If someone has code in a library, the FFT, and it's efficiently coded for a given platform, why recording it myself, investing time in debugging it, instead of just calling and linking to the library that provides me this scientific component, okay? So a part of the component, an important part, are external libraries that we use in our scientific codes because we have sub-problems already efficiently solved on a given platform. And it's the work of the, sub of the support from the centers to provide us with, with libraries that are optimized for the system. So that we just have to link, build an executable, and it will make a very efficient use of these scientific components, okay? But that is not enough. If my problem were only computing one FFT, my problem would be, do, would be solved, just calling one FFT. But you see, usually FFT is only a step within a more complex simulation. I compute the FFT, I take the result, I compute a mat matrix, matrix multiplication, I take the result, somehow I manipulate these results to compute my output. So these are just steps in big scientific applications. So at some point, our code, what we need to do for our science, will not be available as a call to a scientific library. So we will need to analyze code, real code that we need to write, and understand the code, and how this uses or reuses all the outputs from the scientific components, and how all these outputs and my variables all of them are combined to produce my result, okay? So I cannot escape from analyzing what we call code components or patterns. It's the actual code that we write, the pi example. Instead of using a library, I, am, I have decided to code it myself, okay? So you need to code it. So patterns is, when you analyze the serial code, we will propose to identify the components. If you are using components coded by yourself, you will consider, you will need to consider if there is a library out there, highly optimized for a system that you can use. Then you will need to find patterns, sections of code that are not available as external libraries that we, you will need to understand in terms of parallelism to discover parallelism and make a parallel implementation. So for that, once you identify the pattern, <coughs> it will guide you to create parallel patterns. We saw that example with the pi example. Pi example is a scalar reduction. Can be parallelized as a parallel scalar reduction. 
and we can implement this parallel scalar reduction in many different ways. We saw at least four or five implementations in the demo before the break. So how many parallel implementations can I have? Many, as, as many as you can imagine, just combining all the elements that OpenMP and OpenGC provide you, okay? So you will need to generate for the parallel patterns, parallel code as the final step. But here you have many possibilities that you need to uh, compare and select the best one. So how this process fits in the workflow we saw for OpenMP? We remember that we said for real codes, we need to first profile. Why? Because if I have one million lines of code, it doesn't make sense that I start by line number one up to line number one million. It's better that I focus on that part that consumes most of the execution time. Especially if I go to GPU. Remember that we said, remember that you need to minimize data transfers, but you need to have significant workload to offload to the GPU to take advantage of the beast that the GPU, the GPU is a beast. It has huge computational power. So you need big problem sizes to feed that beast so that it can really compute that fast for you, okay? So begin with the hot spots. Then we said that we had these two steps. Find in the hot spots those parts of the code that need to be analyzed for parallelism. Decide how to implement them in parallel and Im make the actual parallel implementation. And this is, in, this, in these two steps, is where the pattern, parallel pattern, and parallel code workflow fits into the, all the general workflow, okay? So you will work iteratively in the general workflow, working on different loops incrementally, adding more and more parallelism to your code. So components, patterns, parallel patterns, translated into parallel code. So more or less, we have already said this, but I want to um, summarize it in a set of four steps. First, real we are talking about taking real applications, so at, re at least not toy examples that we can use in training. An application that is part of your science. First, even if you have not done it, do, do at least one profiling, just to double check that you are focusing on the right path, okay? So you will, you will identify calls, routines, functions, and loops that consume most of the runtime of your application. Second, for each routine contained in an external library, what do you have to do? Remember that you want to run your code on a given platform. You may be using a generic library that has been compiled for a laptop, and that can be ported to Cori. But probably in Cori, you will have installed a highly optimized version of the same library code that you are using in your laptop. So you need to consider identifying the scientific component that you have in your code, this FFT, matrix matrix multiplication, pi, whatever it is, solvers, spectral methods, and consider using the highly optimized version that you have in a given system. So you can have, take advantage of all the work that the staff of the center has done for you, okay? And this is step number two. Step number three, consider if you, you just have to be aware if you are coding a routine that is already available as a library and you were not aware of it, or you had decided not to use it, because you need to take the decision do I want to keep on using my own code? Or do I want to replace this piece of code by one single library code that is highly optimized for the system? Okay, it's up to you. What is better for your science or for your code, given your expertise? But you need to be aware of that and make the appropriate decisions, okay? So in that case, you can consider replacing the corresponding routines with highly optimized library calls available in, in the system where you're going to run. And finally, for the remaining user-defined routines, routines that you have coded as a developer, you need to address the complex process of parallelizing your code. So for this, what we propose is decompose your code into components, particularly in code components, in patterns, and use what we will see next as a guide to generate different parallel versions so that you can pick up the one that performs best, faster on a given architecture. Okay? And this is the final step number four for the remaining user-defined routines. Understand the co compute patterns that you have in your code, okay? So let's see how we can parallelize guided by patterns. Um, in the parallel technology, we have probably eight, nine, 10 patterns. 
but some of them are rarely found in scientific codes. If we have, if we have them, it's because they appear in some domains, but they are not of general use. So what we have, what we have done with Paraguay Trainer is provide for support for those code patterns that are most widely used. And the, we use this terminology, parallel for all, parallel scalar reduction, you have seen this in the pie example, parallel sparse reduction, and parallel sparse for all. And here you have a very simple snippet that represents the key properties that distinguish one pattern from another. Okay? Just intuition. The parallel for all is what the intuition says of what a for all is. For all is typically a loop where all the iterations can be executed concurrently, in parallel, in any order. You need to worry about dependencies or ordering of the iterations. Okay? So this is what sparse or sorry, parallel for all means. We can easily represent this as a loop where in each iteration produces a new value that is stored in a different element of an array. This is typically in scientific and numerical computation. Okay? So this is the typical simple code that you will find when you recognize a parallel for all. Parallel scalar reduction. Now you have a loop where all the iterations compute a value. But what do we do with these values? We don't produce different independent output values in each iteration. What we do is we reduce them all to one single value using a sum operator, multiplication operator, minimum, maximum computation. There are very well known uh, types of reduction operations. So this is typically represented like this. We have the values as we had here. Instead of producing one single different element in one iteration, we reduce them all through this reduction operator. Okay? A sparse reduction is a reduction again. We have a set of values. These values are reduced. But instead of reducing all of them to one single scalar value, we reduce them to a set of values. Okay? Um, this set of values, why is it called sparse? Because the set of values that were these elements are updated depend on something that we don't know until runtime. Typically, do you have experience in finite element codes? Molecular dynamic codes? Okay. Typically, in finite elements or molecular dynamics, you find this type of codes. You iterate on elements or you iterate on uh, molecules. And what you do is you compute the interaction between one molecule or one element with the neighbors. So you need to update that contribution in the list of neighbors, finite element neighbors, or molecular neighbor, in, ne mo uh, neighbor molecular, okay? S molecules. So how do you represent in your code the list of the neighbors of a given molecule, the neighbors of a given finite element? You typically use it through an auxiliary array. This is represented as C, okay? So these sparse reductions can be in general parallelized using similar strategies than we use for scalar reductions. But we need to have into account something additional, that is, the result is not just one value. It's a set of values that we only know what elements will be updated at runtime. So the question is, how can we handle this in the parallelization strategy? Okay? We can do it, and we will see how we can do it. Essentially, this is the use case that we are proposing in the LUL SMK practical that you will do after lunch playing with and learning how to parallelize parallel sparse reductions that appear in many scientific domains. And finally, we have added this recently because we found some uh, use cases that were disappeared. Essentially, we have the for all computation, but now the sparse nature. That is, every single iteration produces a different value, but they can eventually, sorry, compute the value of the same element. They can collide, they can have conflict in producing the same element of the array. But it depends on the value of C. If C is a permutation, there is no conflict. But if C is not a permutation, there are potential conflicts at runtime. Okay? So uh, these are the four patterns that we have supported and recognized in the Parallel Trainer tool. And now we will see how we can parallelize these patterns. So just as a reminder, 
to uh, reinforce the learning. Parallel for all. Typically, a loop that updates all of the elements of an array. Typically, each iteration updates a different element of the array. And the result of the computing of this pattern is an array that is called the output variable. Okay? So how do we parallelize this? Very easy, a parallel loop. You don't need to care to worry about the way the iterations are reordered. You can reorder in the most convenient way for your purposes because they will, you will never have conflict trace conditions in correct parallel behavior, parallel code. A scalar reduction. What you are doing is you are computing multiple values and reducing them into one single value that is called the scalar reduction variable. Important here, you cannot use any operator. You need to use an operator that fulfills two mathematical properties, commutativity and associativity, because this enables reordering 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2 mathematically, but not computationally. Okay, so you need to I guarantee that the operator fulfills these two properties for you to compute the scalar reduction in parallel. Okay? Uh, this is typically coded as a loop, and the result of the pattern is what is called a reduction variable or an output reduction variable. And here we have three different ways of parallelizing it. We have seen in the demonstration before the break, essentially it is a parallel loop. So the same way of coding for all, but adding additional synchronization. Do you remember what the OpenMP standard, OpenMC standard said at the beginning? The programmer is responsible for adding appropriate synchronization to guarantee correctness. So if you execute all the loops of your program with a parallel loop and you don't add any additional synchronization, that code will only be correct if all the code, all the loops are parallel for all. If you have a different pattern, you need to add additional synchronization. So uh, still, you par make create a parallel loop plus different ways of forcing adding the synchronization. Built-in reduction is using the clause of the OpenMP standard or OpenACC standard. But you can uh, alternatively implement it using the atomic protection. We saw an example. And we also have an alternative third implementation that we call explicit privatization that we will see next, okay? So here, for this case, we have three possible parallel implementations. And all of them can be implemented in OpenMP, OpenACC, for GPU offloading, for multi-threading. <coughs> so we can generate many versions, parallel implementations of the same code. The next one is the sparse reduction. So remember that the key distinguishing feature is the array of output and the sparse nature, the and predictability of the values of this indirection. So a sparse reduction combines a set of values into a set of values using, again, a commutative and associative operator and using a vector of array as the output, not a single scalar variable, okay? The set of array elements that will be updated cannot be determined until runtime. Why? Because only at runtime we typically know the neighbors of the molecules in a highly dynamic molecular simulation. The neighbors of a finite element in an adaptive finite element code that changes the connections and refines the mesh of finite elements. Okay? Of course, there are some problems where this array may have fixed values for the whole execution. And this will open different opportunities for optimization. But in any case, you can parallelize the parallel sparse reduction using the same strategies. And finally, all the, all the code patterns have an output. In this case, the output is again a reduction variable, but in this case, not an scalar, an array. Okay? And as it is a reduction, we have the three parallel strategies that we have for the scalar reductions. The parallel loop plus additional synchronization. Okay? if possible, with built-in support from the standards, with atomic and with explicit privatization. And finally, sparse for all. I will not stop on that because it, the way it behaves is, requires different ways of forcing synchronization. But just from the point of view of description, it's very similar to the sparse 
reduction. It updates the elements of an array. The set of array elements cannot be predicted at compile time. It, only, it is only known when you execute the application for the input data set of that run of the application. And again, you have an output variable that is an array. Okay? So, um, if we are able to take our code, our loops, our hotspots, and characterize the loops in terms of these patterns, what do we gain? What are the benefits that we obtain? Okay, patterns enable to ensure correct variable management in the parallel code. What this means is that when you add OpenMP or OpenACC capabilities, up you create the parallel region, you make the work sharing, but you have additional clauses where you have to specify for all the variables in the code, what do you have to do with them? Will you make them private? Will you share them? Will you reduce them among the threads? So you need to remember that you need to specify how to manage all the variables that are used, read or written in your code. So the patterns characterize the computations for a given variable. So it provides you the information that you will need to decide which is the correct way to manage that variable that is the output of the pattern. Okay? The patterns also provide algorithmic rules to recode sequential code into a parallel equivalent. Once we know we have a reduction, we know the statements of my code that update the reduction variable, I know that I can't forget about the rest of the code. From the point of view of that variable, I just need to protect the concurrent access to that statement that updates the variable. So for that variable, I know how to manage appropriately with additional synchronization the, the, the parallel execution so that the code is correct. Okay? So it provides the algorithmic rules to generate parallel code. And that's why Parallel Web Trainer can do it for us. And also, each pattern has a set of parallelization strategies that can be applied to it. So it also supports generation of different parallel versions of our single sequential code using different standards and different hardware platforms. We saw in the dialog that we could choose OpenMP, OpenACC, GPU, CPU, multi-threading, offloading, or tasking paradigms. So all the combinations of this is all the parallel versions that you can generate. Okay? And you can do this because you know the pattern that you have in your code. So let's see, let's see a summary, an overview of all the patterns, the parallelization strategies, and the hardware platforms that I want to use. Okay? So I have kind of a three, four dimensional space of all the combinations. So these are the strategies that we say we have for each of the patterns. And these are the ones that we have implemented in Parallel Trainer. And this is inspired in best practices in parallel programming, for instance, through the analysis of the coral benchmarks. So what you can see here is that for a given pattern, the for all pattern, when you go to the CPU or you offload to the GPU, you have one unique strategy available. That is the parallel loop. This is simply because you don't need any additional synchronization. So you don't need to add any additional synchronization to guarantee correctness. For the scalar reduction, you can see we have three implementations on the CPU, multi-threading, and only two implementations to offload to the GPU. So in both cases, we can use the built-in reduction support of OpenMP and OpenACC. Or we can use the atomic protection that we see by protecting the statement that updates the variable. But on the CPU, you can also use the explicit privatization that is not available for the GPU. The reason for this is that, as we will see next, the explicit privatization, what makes this, creates a private copy of the variable for each of the threads. In the GPU, you typically have thousands of threads. So creating private copies may incur in a lot of memory overhead that make, may make your program inefficient, make the program crash because it runs out of memory. A strange things can happen in your code. And if this is the case for scalars, or maybe, for sparse reductions, then it's mandatory. For sparse reductions, remember that what you are doing is creating a, a copy, private copy of the whole array for each thread. If your array is big, megabytes, and you use 1,000 threads, each thread will be using megabytes of memory to allocate the private copy. 
So typically on the CPU, we can scale up to 16, 60, 100 threads with very fat nodes that have a lot of memory. So we can pay the price of that memory overhead. But on the GPU, we can, can create thousands of threads. Thousands of threads, each of one having its private copy of an array that can need megabytes. So we can easily incur in having been out of memory. So best practices don't recommend to use explicit privatization for a sparse reduction on the GPU. And that's the reason why it is not implemented and supported in the parallel world training tool. Okay? And in the case of the sparse for all, we are working on having this uh, specific privatization <coughs> strategy available on the CPU. It is not applicable to GPU. I will not go into the details of that. And the other strategies also are not applicable to the sparse for all. Because the way you need to combine the, f the partial results on the threads into the final result needs a special synchronization and additional computation that are not valid on the GPU. Okay? So somehow this provides you kind of a summary table of all the possibilities that you can create with OpenMP, OpenACC. This is, remember that, we don't say here OpenMP, OpenACC anywhere. We say multi-threading on the CPU offloading to the GPU because all of these combinations can again be implemented using OpenMP or OpenACC. Okay, so you have many possible implementations to generate and to test on your, on your hardware platform. Okay, so let's go into the details of how each of these, well, what we have not defined yet is, in detail, how these parallelization strategies actually behave. So we need to reinforce and learn exactly how they work. So let's begin with the parallelization strategy parallel for all. This is trivial because if a parallel for all is found, for instance, in this code, this is the same code generated with the par snippets generated with parallel trainer using OpenMP and OpenACC for CPU and for GPU. So what you can see here is that in each iteration, you compute different values that are stored in different memory locations, in different array elements. So you have a for all pattern. So you can parallelize it, how? Just defining the parallel region. The first thing you have to remember is for all the patterns to go to, a, to make a parallel implementation is first, where the parallel region begins and ends. If you are focusing on the analysis of loops, typically the parallel region begins right before the loop header and ends right before, right after the end of the loop. Okay? So this identifies the section of code to be executed concurrently, either on the multi-threaded CPU or offloaded to the GPU. The next thing you need to do is, remember, you need to manage every single variable that is used in the code, you need to implicitly or explicitly say this variable will be shared among the threads, will be private to its thread, will be reduced all the pri private local values of the threads to one single value at the end. So you need to specify every single value <coughs> variable. So in the OpenMP implementation at this in this version, we force as best practice for learning default none. Default known what means in OpenMP and OpenACC is that the compiler, OpenMP or PC compiler, will fail to compile your code if you don't specify all of the variables that are used here, either in a shared, a private, or a reduction clause. Okay? There are some additional variants. First private, last private. We don't go into that detail. What you have to remember is that all the variables that are used, you are forcing that you need to specify them explicitly here. So in this case, all the variables that are read-only are shared, but also the array that is the output can be shared among the threads. Shared means that all the threads can access concurrently to the array. As every iteration will be accessing a different element, you don't have two different threads accessing to the same element at the same time. That situation cannot occur because the parallel loop, parallel for all pattern guarantees that cannot occur. If the analysis is correct in terms of patterns, it is safe to just create a parallel region, schedule the iterations of the loop in the order that is better for your code, run it in parallel, and the code will be always correct. Okay? This is the power of the parallel uh, for all pattern. 
And additionally here, <coughs> again, for the sake of promoting and helping in learning, we force, we add to the schedule, to the four, the close, the close schedule. What this means, you will have several options to map the iterations of the loop in different orders to the, um, to the threads. As you all raised your hands when I asked if you uh, have written MPI code, here essentially what you can make is a block distribution of the iterations among the threads, a cyclic distribution of the iterations among the threads, a cyclic one, cyclic two, cyclic n distribution of the iterations in blocks among the threads. So the same concepts are how that you apply to data distributions in MPI implementations. The same concepts are applied here to the uh, specification of the way that the iterations of the loop are mapped, are assigned to the threads in the, within the current parallel region. Okay? So we just put here auto. This delegates choosing the right schedule to the compiler. But you can edit here and write static, static one, dynamic, runtime, four or five options that you can easily change to make different experimentations with your code. Okay? So in terms of concepts, with the parallel loop, you can specify where the parallel region begins and ends, all the variables forcing the for node if they are shared, private, or array. The, in particular, the output array of the parallel loop needs to be shared because there is guarantee that no risk condition will, uh, will appear. And also, you need to play with the work sharing construct and modify its default behavior using the schedule clause. Okay? So once you identify in the loop the pattern, you can have used this information to take decisions on how to add correct code in OpenMP or in OpenACC. Okay? Any questions about this? Great. So let's move on to the first type of synchronization that we need to add to this fully parallel loop, to this parallel for all. That is parallel loop with built-in reduction. Again, here we have a code that we already know, that is the computation of pi, the same example we used before the break. And here, the, re the reduction is this variable sum, that is taking the re final result of summing all the elements that are produced wh while evaluating these iterations, this expression for different values of i, and i is the loop index. So in general, we have a reduction, a scalar reduction that is each iteration produces a different value, a different value, and in the end, at the end of the loop, we want to reduce them all with a sum reduction in this case to one single final value. Okay? So again, the loop is characterized by a scalar, parallel scalar reduction. How do we translate this into parallel code? Again, definition of the loop region begins and ends in the limits of the loop, before and after the beginning and the end of the loop. Again, forcing with the foul none, we are forcing the specification of all the variables that are used in the, in, the, in, the, in the loop. Here note that if you specify, you declare some variables inside the loop, there is no need to specify them in the parallel region because the variable is not declared here, is not available here. It's local automatically to the thread that has been assigned that iteration. Okay? So, even the way we declare the variables in our code can help us to make simpler the OpenMP or the OpenACC implementation. If we declare x outside of the loop, we need to add x here as a private variable. If we declare it inside and the code is still correct numerically, then I don't have a need to really specify x here because it doesn't exist before the loop. Okay? So even taking into account these kind of recommendations in coding that are very easy to implement for any of us can help us to produce simpler OpenMP and OpenACC implementations. So as a rule of thumb, all the read-only variables that you can find here in big codes, all the variables that are not written, that are read, all of them need to be shared. Okay? Only those variables that are written need to be somehow managed 
with additional synchronization. In this case, the only variable that is written, apart from x that is not, that is only declared within the loop, body scope, is the variable sum. And the pattern is telling us that sum is the reduction variable. So we know that in order to parallelize it, the additional synchronization we need to add is to put for reduction plus col semi uh, columns sum. And this is instructing the compiler to generate the synchronization to make the reduction of these values. Okay? So share variables. Again, the work sharing with for a schedule auto. And this is what we have commented, the reduction. The variables that are read only, in particular the variable that is the output of the pattern, we know exactly what we need to do with it. Uh, in, in modern C code, you can do this. In Fortran, you have many more restrictions. Do you typically write code in Fortran, in C? Mm. In C. C99 allows you to do that. So any modern C, you should be able to do this with no problem. In Fortran, depending on the pro Fortran flavor that you use, you may be allowed to do this, or you may be forced to declare all the variables at the beginning of the function. So you are forced to manage the data scoping of those variables in the clauses of the OpenMP program. So C is more flexible in that, in that sense. It's easier if you follow. Yeah, but this is usually easier because you forget about a variable. You don't need to manage it in the parallel region. Okay. <coughs> okay, so. What, is, what we don't know here is exactly how all this set of elements, these expressions are reduced and the order. This is up to the compiler to opt make the reduction operations in the order that are optimal for a given platform. Okay? So we delegate on the compiler the way, the order in which all the elements produced by the threads are really combined. And we don't care about it. The compiler will do a good job at that and will guarantee that the result is correct. Okay? Okay, so the next strategy is parallel loop with additional synchronization using atomic operations. Are you familiar with uh, uh, mm, mutual exclusion? Mutual exclusion concept? Atomicity concept? Okay, let's see what this means. It's we, it, depending on the discipline, we have different names for the same thing. So, um, okay, the scenario is, is the same, it's, the, it's as follows. We have a variable, S, that is shared. So we have shared memory that all the threads can access at any time. So in particular, any thread can access at any time to the variable S. What that means is that thread zero and thread one can access at the same time. So we need to force another so that they don't, uh, um, they don't, uh, how do I, how, how, how do I, could I say this? They don't, uh, if you don't, let's say it a different, it's a different way. If you don't guarantee that when the threads access to the shared variable s, do it in an exclusive way so that when the thread is reading the value zero, adding the value plus one, and the result is storing it in the same shared variable, if another thread can interrupt that process, what you can do is that you can have incorrect val final value of the sum. Why? Because mutual exclusion, atomicity has not been guaranteed. Okay. So the way to code this in parallel with atomic is each thread, all the threads will access to the shared variable. So during the execution of the parallel loop concurrently, you will have thread zero reading the value of S, summing, adding, 
a value and storing the result in the same in the same location. At the same time, thread number one can do the same. At the same time, thread number two can do the same. So what you need to do, only what you need to do is to protect this plus equal operation with atomic. What atomic means is that whenever the thread zero is doing this plus equal operation, the rest of the threads will be waiting until thread zero finishes the plus equal operation. When it finishes, it keeps on working, and then th other thread is granted access to the mutual exclusion section. So again, without interference from other thread, he computes the plus equal operation. Okay? So this guarantees atomicity, the operation of the plus equal. If we don't guarantee this, the result in general will be incorrect. So in parallel, what we have is all the threads in the different iterations are doing different plus equal operations on the same shared variable, thousands of them. So we need to execute thousands of atomic instructions to protect that part. So intuitively, you can see that there is a lot of additional synchronization that you are adding using this strategy because every single plus equal operation needs to be atomically protected. Okay? And the number of atomic operations that you are seeing is proportional to the problem size. If you have 1,000 iterations, 1,000 atomic. 20 billion operation, iterations, 20 billion atomic. So the parallelization overhead, the amount of synchronization rises when you rise the problem size. And when you rise the problem size, usually it's because you want to go to the GPU. So you will need, you will need to find a balance, a trade-off, when you use this uh, strategy on the CPU or on the GPU. Okay? Clear? The concept of okay. mutual exclusion. So okay, from the point of view of implementation, again, we repeat the same series of things. Definition of the parallel region, enclosing the loop that we have analyzed in terms of code patterns. Shared variables, all the read-only variables are shared. Again, work sharing, all the loop iterations are shared among the threads according to a schedule. Auto to delegate it to the compiler, or we can specify a static, a static one, dynamic runtime. We have several options there. And what changes from the previous strategy is that in the previous strategy to handle the reduction, the scalar reduction of the variable sum, we just added here reduction plus sum. Reduction plus sum. Now, instead of that, what we do is we atomically protect the update of the reduction variable. Okay? So you can see that there are many common steps in the implementation shared among all the patterns, particularly the definition of the parallel region, the rules to, to determine what variables are shared, the work sharing, and also how to implement and to, atomi to make the add the synchronization to protect those parts of the code that, need, that are sensitive in the parallel execution. And we have all the information by using these patterns. Okay? So finally, <coughs> we have the third strategy that is the parallel loop with explicit privatization. Let's see how this behaves in practice. Now we have a slightly different scenario. We still have the shared memory and the shared variable so that all the threads can access at any time to the shared variable. But now we call it explicit privatization because what we are doing is we create exactly a copy of the shared variable in each of the threads. So each thread has its private data, its private copy of the same shared data. If the shared data is a scalar, each thread has a private scalar. If the shared data is an array, each thread will have a private array. So once the memory has been allocated, what happens during the computation? In this case, thread zero works with private copy S0. So no need for atomic protection because by construction of the shared memory programming of OpenMP, no other thread can access to this variable. Only thread zero can access to copy zero. Only thread one can access to copy one. So this is a key difference between them. 
because we, we are removing all the atomic protection that is needed during the computation. The threads work completely independently from the rest of the threads with no synchronization. Where is the, over, the parallelization overhead in the amount of memory? Where is the, the parallelization overhead of the atomic uh, protection strategy in atomic operations? And you don't incur in additional memory. So parallelization in terms of parallelization overhead, we always need to find a trade-off between additional synchronization with atomic or mutual exclusion and additional memory to create private copies of variables to decouple the execution in parallel of the different threads. And having these two things in mind and finding the right balance for the code is where you can really create, is how you can really create a very efficient parallel implementation of your code. Indeed, privatization is one of the most effective ways to really implement a scalable parallel code in real applications. So during the computation, no atomic protection is needed. But of course, each thread at the end has its own private copy, has a partial sum of the, of the final result. So we need to do something else that was not needed in atomic protection. What do we need to do? Each thread contributes to the shared memory, shared copy, its private and local result. And as here, the final private partial result is summed to the shared memory, here we need atomic protection. So in this case, we only need as many atomic protections as number of threads that we have. In contrast to the problem size, you can have one billion iterations and four threads, four atomics. In the, other, in, the other, in the other approach, you have one billion iterations, one billion atomics for four threads. Okay? So it's always a trade-off between the amount of memory to reduce or remove synchronization and the amount of synchronization that you need or the minimum synchronization you need to guarantee correctness. Okay? So with explicit privatization, by explicitly creating private copies for each thread of the original variable, you decouple the execution during the computation, so very fast, very, very efficient, and you only need to synchronize at the very end. And here is what you can do with the parallel, with the parallel trainer. This is again the same pie example. Before going to the case of arrays, let's start with the simple case of scalars. We have the same pie example that you already know. So what has happened here? The tool has created the parallel region, has created the work sharing, and now instead of making atomic protection or of making close reduction, it has created a preamble before the loop that is create a private copy for its thread. Now in the loop, the, the reference, the use of the original shared variable has been replaced with usage of the thread local variable. So here, all the threads are working independently with no synchronization at all. Once they finish, then they take each thread using atomic protection, update the, the final shared variable with the private result using a post -tumble. So somehow the explicit privatization would make this for the original loop creates three stages in the parallel implementation. The same loop replacing the original uses of the reduction variable with private copies, a preamble to declare the private copy and initialize it, and a post to reduce, to compute the final result using the thread local partial results computed by each thread. This is what you see here. Preamble, main body, and the post -tumble. Okay? This, applies, this can be applied to scalars, but can also be applied to arrays. And this is what you will probably, if you complete the Lulesh practical, you will be doing this with a quite complicated code by using Parallel World Trainer. Again, the same loop, parallel region, work sharing with the schedule. Again, the usage of the global variable, Y, replaced by the usage of the private copy. Preamble, allocate a private copy. But now it's not just declaring a scalar. You need to allocate the memory and you need to initialize each of the elements of the array. So the tool will generate this code for you. So the preamble is about generating private copies 
with all the elements that the variable, the original variable has. If it is a scalar, it's trivial. If it is array, it's as many elements as the original array has. Okay? So here, it concurrently, each thread works without interacting with any other thread on its private copy. And finally, we make critical is another way that we can use in OpenMP to guarantee atomicity, mutual exclusion. What this means is that when one thread enters in this critical section, only one thread will be updating the sequence, the original shared variable with the values computed locally. When it finishes, the rest of the threads are waiting. Another thread is granted access. Another thread enters, computes this, while the rest are, the remaining are waiting, and so on, until all the threads are granted access sequentially to compute this part. So in the end, what you have is the same result as in scalars, the original variable computing the global result of the array. Okay? This is what you see, for instance, in the real Lulez application of the coral benchmarks. They, highly, they make further optimizations by reducing the amount of memory they use here. But essentially, the concepts, the best practices, recommendations, is what you can find in our tool today. This comes from that work that we published with Ulrich and with Julich to understand how experts in parallel programming code real applications. And this can be applied to many scientific fields, finite elements, finite volumes, molecular dynamics, and many other fields, where this sparse, this parallel sparse reduction appears. Okay? Remember that this can be applied to sparse reduction. Okay? And remember that for sparse reduction, you usually don't have built-in support in the standards. There is some differences for Fortran and C, something, but in general, you should consider that there is not support to make reductions on arrays in OpenMP and OpenACC, apart from some exceptions that you have in the standards. Okay? So that's the reason why for arrays, for a sparse reduction, you need to use for atomic protection on the GPU and on the multi-threaded CPU. And on the GPU, on the multi-threaded CPU, you can use this explicit privatization strategy. That cannot be applied to GPU because we said in GP we will create, allocate private copies of the whole array for thousands of threads exploding memory usage and will easily run out of memory or, or the application may crash. Okay? That's why we don't support, we don't recommend using this strategy for the GPU. Okay, so pros and cons. I think that more or less we have discussed all of this, but this is somehow to summarize pros and cons of uh, um, of each of these strategies. In general, remember that the only one that has no synchronization overhead is parallel loop. And it is easy to implement. It is great because you don't need any additional synchronization. The analysis in terms of patterns guarantees that each iteration writes on a different memory location. No need to worry about potential race conditions or incorrect behavior. The built-in reduction it's great if you have support in OpenMP or OpenACC. It's similar as in MPI. You have in MPI, you have MPI reduce. MPI reduce is an implementation of a reduction operation across the MPI ranks. So somehow, reduction operations are so common that all the parallel programming tools have some built-in support for reduction operations. The question is, what you need to, you need to analyze is what reduction operations are supported by the tool you are using. Because if the operation is supported, it's great. You just call, use the built-in support, and everything will work just fine. If it's not, then you need to use alternative implementations. Now the most recent versions of OpenMP enable to provide user-defined reduction operations. But this has come in OpenMP 5, I think. And here we are considering up to uh, OpenMP 4.5. So up to 4.5, you didn't have that feature. But this is something that is coming in the next upcoming releases of compilers. But anyway, if you decide not to use it, or you, you don't want to use those features, or you have them available, you still have two other strategies that you can use. The atomic is very easy to understand. You don't need to change the code. You just need to execute the code fully parallel, and those operations that are the reduction operations in add a synchronization to guarantee atomic protection. Intuitively, it's easy to maintain, easy to understand, easy to apply. But as we said, cons, 
synchronization overhead is proportional to the problem size, the number of iterations, not to the number of threads. Okay? And the memory requirements are minimum because you are only using the same memory that you use in the sequential code. The explicit privatization has drawbacks in terms of memory. You are using more memory, much more memory, potentially for arrays. But this allows you to remove synchronization and reduce the synchronization overhead to a number of operations, atomic operations that is proportional to the number of threads, not to the problem size. So you can scale to very large problem sizes for your science and your application parallel, parallel application will still scale in performance. As far as we understand, the built-in support handled by the compiler behaves more or less like the explicit privatization. Because if you measure performance, it's, they are more or less very similar. What we, we expect from the compilers that they are able to make more optimized implementations of the final reduction operation that we are implementing right now in Parallel Trainer. There are other ways to do the, that reduction, using trees, using schemes that allow, instead of doing that final reduction sequentially, one thread after the other, you can somehow do that in parallel in different stages. So compilers are supposed to do that optimizations for the hardware platform that you have. And, but of course, you can further optimize the implementation of explicit privatization by optimizing the amount of memory that you allocate. Instead of allocating a full copy of the array, you can allocate less memory as long as that memory is used and correctly referenced in your code. And you can reduce the amount of synchronization overhead by implementing some kind of tree reduction in the final part. But that would make this learning these concepts a bit more complicated. So we, didn't, we have decided not to implement that in the versions we have available so far. Okay? So more or less, this, has, this is the everything you have. So you can, in the practicals, you will be playing with examples that has examples of all the three patterns. So when you modify a loop, you can generate a different version of your code where for each loop, you can generate all of these versions. So in the LULSMK, you have 12 loops. 12 loops, each loop, you can apply two or three strategies. You could generate up to 40 different versions, parallel versions of your code, okay? By just combining different strategies applied to different loops across the whole code. So doing that by hand is very, very time consuming. So the trainer helps a lot in learning and in producing code and in making the experimentation and helping in the implementation process of implementing all of these variants of the parallel code, okay? One thing we will not explore, but you, will, you have in the, in the documentation, is something we have already added in Parallel Trainer 1.2, the version you have in Kodi. In Kodi. Very briefly, we have added support for tasking. Tasking is another paradigm that is raising a lot of interest in some scientific domains. So it's a possibility that you have there. You can use, again, more possibilities for the different strategies, for the different patterns to generate more versions of the code. And this is more or less what we are generating right now. The same by loop can be implemented in parallel instead of using for to do the work sharing. The work sharing is implicitly done by creating tasks that are finally synchronized with task weight. This is the tasking support typical of OpenMP 3.5. You have it available in Trainer 1.2. And also we have added support for the task loop pragma in OpenMP 4.5. So with this implementation of this syntax, you have also a tasking implementation of the, of the same code. Okay? Okay, this is just for your reference. You are not expected to play, to play with this unless you are interested and you want to explore it during the practical. Okay? Okay, and this is upcoming work that we will be working on reductions also supported in the tasking paradigm. Okay, so I think that's all we wanted to cover. So remember and keep in mind that this is what you really need to have in mind. Because during the practicals, you will be able to generate all of these versions for all of the loops that you have in the example codes that we will share with you in the practicals, okay? Any questions? So concepts, pattern, strategies that are applicable to each pattern. So different ways of implementing it. And then you can implement each of these strategies using a a choice of OpenMP, OpenACC, offloading multi-threading, tasking, 
GPU, CPU. So you have a lot of possibilities to generate and to play for your code.